So I have read a lot of books and a lot of big book series, but none of them are as bizarre as the Dark Tower series. There is nothing quite like the Dark Tower. Out of all the book series out there, all the different authors and different styles, this one is truly unique. It has a unique setting, a unique world, unique style, everything. Now, sometimes that uniqueness can be charming and fascinating. Other times it's so strange, you're not sure if it's brilliant or mad. This is either madness or brilliant. So I'm the book guy and today I want to introduce you to this classic dark fantasy series to help you decide for yourself if you want to read it. Let's begin our journey to the Dark Tower. fled across the desert, and the gunslinger followed. Roland is a gunslinger, so that's sort of a lone sheriff lawman in the wild west of this world called Midworld. And Midworld is a, well, it's sort of a parallel world. It's both like and unlike Earth. So Roland is pursuing a dark sorcerer known only as the Man in Black. Both men are fighting and racing each other to reach the mysterious Dark Tower. The Man in Black leaves behind all sorts of magical traps for Roland to stumble into. Violent townsfolk under a curse, terrible mutants and a mountain path filled with tricky chasms. Yet this is only Roland's first great challenge on his epic journey towards the Dark Tower. We don't know exactly what the tower is at this stage, but we do know that Roland and the Man in Black are not the only ones trying to reach it. And if the wrong person reaches it first, it could have terrible consequences, not just for this world, but for all worlds. Roland also starts to realise that he can't succeed in this epic journey alone. He needs to put together a team. Look, we're going to talk about plots and characters in a little bit, but the world building here is just so cool, and I'm a geek, so we're going to talk about it first. So Roland's world is technically called Midworld. Although that is a term that's almost never used, it's just simply Roland's world. The world is like the American Wild West, but it's also blended with uh, classic fairy tales and mixed with a certain post-apocalyptic vibe as well. I told you it was weird. Midworld has moved on. That's a vague term that gets used a lot during the series, and it sort of described Midworld as just sort of being in the state of decay or uh, disrepair. It is similar to Earth, but it's not Earth. For example, they do have trains and guns and explosives. They have many fairy tales from our own world. They even have the song Hey Jude by the Beatles. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. You get the idea. The Arthurian legends also play a big role in this world. So Roland himself is a descendant from the original King Arthur. But the world is also very different because it has magic. Things like wizards, crystal balls, spells, and divination of the future. There are dragons, some dinosaurs, and mutants from nuclear radiation. It's just this weird smorgasbord of everything thrown in and mixed together. Now, I do want to explain a little bit about what the Dark Tower itself Self is, but that's something that's not revealed straight away in the books. It's a few books in. So if you want to go in fully blind and know nothing about it, skip to the time on the screen. But I do want to explain a little bit about what it is because it's actually really interesting and incentive to read the series. A major part of the magic of Midworld is the ability to reach into other worlds. You see, there are infinite worlds in the whole Stephen King universe. And just to be clear, it's not multiple dimensions, it's multiple worlds, okay? So it's not parallel dimensions and infinite universes. It's one universe, but with infinite worlds. But there is a dark tower in each world. Now, it's not a literal dark tower. It's sort of like a cosmic dark tower. Like, each world is one level of the tower itself. But the true tower is in Midworld, the world of Roland. So that makes it a great nexus point for all magic and all convergence in the entire universe. So Roland wants to reach the tower so that he can understand the great mystery of the cosmos. He wants to find whatever god or deity is inside and question them and learn the ultimate truth. But other forces want to find the tower and use this great wellspring of power to corrupt all the worlds into a darker image. 
So Midworld is like the center world for all other worlds. The series links almost every other Stephen King series in some way. Some characters in Midworld can reach into other worlds, stepping into them or drawing people out of the others. Sometimes there are portals in these other worlds that people and other characters can step through into Narnia, I mean Midworld. And it's not just heroes who find these portals into Midworld. Some of the villains from other Stephen King series show up here too. So the first book is very much a story of Roland versus the Man in Black, so Dark Sorcerer versus Gunslinger. In books two and three, there is a new, bigger emphasis on Roland recruiting. You see, he realizes that he needs a lot of help in this great task, because the road to the Dark Tower is extremely dangerous. More than that, he also realizes that he has moral weaknesses. Roland is almost too single-minded in achieving his goal, and when he's left alone, he develops a sort of tunnel vision, making him extremely dangerous. So there's a lot of reaching and stepping into other worlds for Roland to find his companions. Roland and his companions form a quartet. It's a fellowship of sorts, uh, but with bonds deeper than family, and each one brings something unique to the team. And seriously, the quartet is one of the best things about the Dark Tower series. Like, each character is really well fleshed out, and together, the bond they have is just so evocative, and you get so invested into their relationship and their, and their team. We'll talk about them more in a minute, but for now, each member does help the troop advance through new challenges and together they start making incredible progress. Now, moving on to book four, it's very interesting because most of it is a prequel. The majority of this book is Roland finally opening up to his quartet and sharing his journey before this point, even explaining his previous quartet. It's a strong novel in this series. It does sort of delay the quest a little bit, but it also really expands the world building and the mythos of this world. So books five, six, and seven, well, they're the really weird ones. You see, the whole series has been a little weird and a little experimental up till this point, but around book five, you get the sense that Stephen just clearly leaned into the weird all the way. It might make you scratch your head a little bit in bewilderment a few times, but it's also here where I feel like the series just sort of shed away any last reservation about being weird and just confidently became weird. That's it. I'm gay, I like myself, and I'm not living a lie anymore. So the last three books there, they are a trilogy, focusing very much on the cartet fighting a slew of enemies from multiple worlds all trying to lay claim to the Dark Tower. It also includes, yes, the final trek to the Dark Tower and the final answer. There is also an eighth novel to this series, and it was written ten years after the series was completed. It's a midquill, set between books four and five, which is why I've kind of positioned it there. You can read it in the publication order at the end of the series, or you can put it in the middle. It does work on either way that it's entirely up to you and your preference. It's a really brilliant novel where Roland tells a story to his quartet about a time when he was working as a lawman hunting a mass murderer who was a shapeshifter. But it's curious because in this story, he meets meets a young boy who survived one of these murder sprees and is very traumatized, so Roland tells the boy a story within a story, which is the story itself, The Wind Through the Keyhole, which is about wizards and dragons. Bit more of a fairy tale vibe. So the book is technically three novellas kind of set within each other, but it absolutely works and it's quite a brilliant story. So looking at the characters themselves, the first big one is Roland, of course. So Roland is inspired slash entirely based off the man with no name, the character played by Clint Eastwood in three separate Western films, those being A Fistful of Dollars, a few dollars more, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. This man is often a completely silent or very soft-spoken gunman, but he's a tough warrior and has a firm stance for justice. So Roland is entirely that silent lone gunman, straight out of a Western film. He's tough and stoic, yet wise and fearless. Roland is also ancient. He has some magical abilities as well, S certain things like hypnosis or some telepathic abilities, just enough to give him a bit of an edge. And just like the character he is inspired by, Roland is almost single-minded when it comes to pursuing his goals. So Jake is an 11-year-old boy that Roland meets in the very first book. At first, it seems like Jake 
died in Earth and he came to Midworld in a sort of afterlife. Yet later on, we meet multiple Jakes from other worlds. Jake is this sort of enigma, like a child of destiny, if you will. So even though he's young, Jake has a bucket load of talent. He's a natural gunslinger. He's also got an unusual sixth sense. I see dead people. I must confess. I'm a bit psychic. He develops a father-son relationship with Roland through the series, and he also has a deep love for the Cartet. So Jake is always the one who is encouraging the Cartet to be more honest, more open, more caring with each other. Then we have Susanna slash Odetta slash Detta. I don't know which name to use without spoilers. I'm so sorry. I'll try not to give away too much. The thing is, when we first meet Sus Susanna in New York City in the 60s, she actually has two personalities sitting inside of her and neither are aware of each other. So one personality is a civil rights activist who has a very upper class good education and speaks fancy. The other one is violent and vulgar and foul mouthed and uses every swear word you can think of. And over time, we meet Susanna, the more balanced of the two. So Susanna was attacked as a child and hit on the head with a brick, causing this fracture of her personalities into two separate ones. Later, she was randomly attacked and pushed in front of a train, where she lost both of her legs just above the knees. So now she's an amputee, but she's also tough as iron and makes one hell of a gunslinger. Finally, we have Eddie. So at first glance, this guy is the clear comic relief of the series. But soon we realize that this guy's greatest superpower is his people skills. Eddie knows how to talk to people. He knows how to reach out to people and form connections. Essentially, Eddie becomes the heart of the cartet. He often gets teamed up with Roland, which is a match made in heaven. Roland being so stoic and practical and Eddie being so charming and essential it reminds me of that Witcher video. So I just had to introduce all the members of the Cartet because King's character work is one of his greatest strengths. It always has been. One of the greatest joys of the series is knowing each of these members so intensely and seeing the way that they get along with each other. Yet Stephen King's character work shines just as much with his darker characters. Let's look at some villains. The Man in Black is a sorcerer, a very dark sorcerer. This menacing character doesn't actually have a personality. He's like Sauron or Palpatine. You know, no subtle to the character, just intense evil. And that kind of makes him delightful. This guy is all about chaotic evil and just doing as much damage as possible. The Man in Black is a charming liar. He's a shapeshifter and a clever con man who's able to work both in the open and in the shadows. He has many names and many guises throughout this world and throughout many of Stephen King's worlds. Yet as bad as he is, the Man in Black is just a servant to the Crimson King. So this king is one of the last descendants of King Arthur, just like Roland is. But, well, he's the real world inspiration for the devil. The Crimson King is the ultimate orchestrator of all chaos and evil in the entire Stephen King universe. He is the final antagonist, whereas the Man in Black wants to find the Dark Tower and use its power, the Crimson King wants to break it. So these are two really big and really cool villains, but they're also kind of faceless. There's not much of a personality to them, no subtlety, they're just pure evil. But they're also so damn cool and mysterious that they totally work on the page. That said, if you do want villains who have a bit more personality, there are plenty of them through the series as well. There are plenty of smaller scale villains who are just filled with spite and bitterness. There are traitorous family members and kinsfolk. Regular people who sometimes just give in to their hidden darker desires. It's something that this master of horror does a very good job of. <laughs> There is a bit of a story behind the story of the Dark Tower. So the first book, The Gunslinger, actually took 12 years to write. Which might surprise you considering it's such a short book. But let's dig into why that is. So King was inspired by Robert Browning's 1855 poem, Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came. He started writing in 1970 on a random bit of green paper he found at his local library, and that was the originator of the Dark Tower series. This was before he had even published his first book, Kari, while he was an unknown author. He published The Gunslinger as a novella in 1978, and then two years later he started writing other novellas that continued on from that point. Finally, in 1982, he published the novel The Gunslingers, but it was actually just those five separate novellas all published together. Now here's the funny thing, 
At this point, King knew he wanted to write a book series, but he'd also never written a series before, nor has he since. If you look up Stephen King's list of published works, you'll notice that 90% of the books King writes are standalone novels. Very occasionally he writes a sequel, but he doesn't do trilogies or series at all. And that's kind of his thing. King's writing style is all based on new ideas and big concepts. You can also see this in how he finishes books. You see, one of the most common criticisms Stephen King gets as a writer is that his endings are a bit of a disappointment, right? They're a bit of a letdown. And I can kind of see it too. It's it's kind of like he gets bored of the story and wants to move on to the next big idea. So he just kind of rushes the ending a little bit in certain books. I can't say for certain what his motivation is. Look, something shiny! Where? But for whatever reason, King rarely writes two books in a row. So when he decided that he wanted to write The Dark Tower in a long series, he really struggled. That's why the series has huge gaps between publications. So if we line them all up, the first four books came out uh, 1982, 1987, 1991, 1997, right? It was very sporadic, almost a five year gap between each one. Worst of all, book three ended with a massive cliffhanger, and then he took six years to write the next one. I mean, that didn't affect me when I read the series in 2020. I just picked up the next book immediately. Oh no! Anyway! But it still feels rude all the same. <laughs> but don't judge him too hard. I also know King at this point was going through a very strong alcoholic and drug addiction. Basically took over his life. Then, King suffered a terrible accident. You might have heard about this one. So in 1999, uh, a distracted driver veered off the road onto a footpath and struck down Stephen King while he was outside walking. It very nearly killed him. He was incredibly close to death. It took him years to recover and rehabilitate, and you can read more about it in his book On Writing. He was writing a how to write book at the time when the accident occurred, and that was the book he focused on in coming out and healing. Also the book Dreamcatcher, but separate thing. So for better or worse, this was a major wake up call for Stephen King in his entire life. He started working to cut back all of his addictions and he stopped putting off finishing the Dark Tower series. He plotted and worked on that trilogy for the next few years and eventually released them very close together. 2003, 2004, and also 2004. I mean, that's an incredibly strong life turnaround. And so just like, well done, Stephen King. The guy clearly exhibited some incredible self-control and determination at that point. And I just have so much respect for him for what he did there. It's also worth noting that while he was doing those three books at the same time, he was also writing um, a revised version of the original book. That was in 2003. So that's why I have two copies of The Gunslinger. You might notice that I've got uh, this old one here and the, and the new one here. So just so you know, I do have one of the original versions of the uh, the 1980 version, and then this one was re um, released in 2003. The reason for it is that the original version had a ton of inconsistencies with the rest of the series, because he didn't know that he was going to write a series. It was a little bit different in style and theme. The original version had a ton of continuity errors and a lot of stylistic changes. The, uh, the latest version fixed all of that and made it fit with the rest of it. So definitely read the latest version. I did get an original version just because I wanted to read it out of academic interest to see the changes, and I haven't even done it yet. <laughs> Besides, there's a list of changes and comparisons on Wikipedia about the book anyway, so it was a bit easy just to read that. But yes, that's the story behind the story. Oh, and uh, one little note too, you might notice that this has one of those god-awful movie versions of the cover. About the movie, I didn't include it in my script, but uh, the movie is quite awful. It's truly terrible, and it's just dumb. <laughs> I know Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey uh, are the two main actors in that, and they genuinely did a good job acting, and there's a lot of like cool visuals to it, but the story is so bad to the point of being nonsensical, and there's just a whole bunch of inconsistencies with the world. Just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Even separate to the series, it's just a terrible film. <laughs> Okay, so I love The Dark Tower, and I deeply love Stephen King. I've been a fan of his for years. He was like my idol during my teenage years. But I gotta admit, there are some dodgy parts to this series. Part of it comes from King's writing style and some of the limitations he might have. 
Um, so he never does a series, and that means each book in the series works really well on its own, but together there's a little bit of a disjointedness between them. They don't quite flow. It's a little bit hard to explain without giving spoilers, so I'll just say that and you might see what I mean when you read it. Another problem is the long list of inconsistencies between books. So again, Stephen King had never written a series, so there are continuity errors, and they are pretty minor overall, but you can look them up and see a list of them if you wanted to. Again, they're so small, but when you start noticing, it can bug you. For example, the character Susanna, she ha she was amputated from um, up just above the knees all the way down. Well, there are several lines about her uh, resting on her knees, or even leaping to her feet. Ugh. Hey, could we stop and get a slushy? There are also some continuity errors within uh, the magic and the world building itself, and the certain fate of certain characters. So. It is only minor, but it might bug you. The series also has a lot of anti-climax. Some of the big showdowns are over very quickly, and some action scenes have so much build-up, and then they have very little actual action. And it's not done very well. I, I do know that anti-climax is a, uh, it's a legitimate writing technique, but this feels more like King was just like, that'll do, and got a bit lazy. And there's also the uh, the sheer weirdness of the writing. And I'm going to talk a bit, little bit more in a second about the weirdness. Um, but there are times when you encounter something that's just so weird, it pulls you out of the story. And you put the book down and you're like, is that brilliant or really dumb? I cannot tell. And it is almost distracting in that sense. I heard one critic say about The Dark Tower, it's a great story. It's just a pity Stephen King was the one to write it which seems needlessly cruel and personal, but I kind of get it. It is a great story, but you also notice King's uh, writing style. It's sometimes the greatest strength of the series and also sometimes the greatest weakness. But to his credit as well, there is a fair amount of experimentation and risk-taking with the storytelling here. And I love that. I think so often fantasy books and just everything on the market is too safe and too familiar because that's how people publish books and make money. I love any time uh, an author or a filmmaker wants to experiment and try something new. But there is a risk to that because sometimes new things just fall flat. Sometimes it means they don't find the audience or sometimes the experimentation just fails and it doesn't work in the story. There's always a risk when you try to do something new. But the question here is, do all of those flaws I just m mentioned actually make the series bad? Will they stop you from enjoying it? See, this is a topic I've wanted to talk about on my channel for the longest time, and I finally get the chance to talk about it today. Let's discuss enjoyment versus quality. <laughs> So people often assume that the amount that they enjoyed a piece of art is directly proportional to the objective quality of that art. So if you liked it a lot, that must mean it's good, right? That is simply not true. Before I explain it, let me give you two examples. You remember that infamous 2003 film, The Room? You know, they made that film The Disaster Artist based off it. It has this iconically bad scene. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Ugh. I mean, it's so much cringe. It's dumb on so many levels. Like, the dialogue is off. They dubbed over the acting lines, and the dub doesn't match. Like, it's not just out of time. The body language is so over the top and loud, and the voice acting is flat. And yet none of it's as bad as that awful segue. Oh, hi, Mark. Yet this film, The Room, is often called the best worst film. The film is unintentionally fun to watch. It's, it's cringe and dumb, but it's kind of hilarious. So the quality in this film is rock bottom, but the enjoyment can be top tier if that's something you're interested in. Second example here is the 2017 film, Logan. So this is an excellent film. Uh, it subverts the superhero genre, uh, it's phenomenal acting by the main cast all around, and some truly excellent action scenes. Like for one, I do love this fight in the forest at the end, where you see such an intense berserker rage. I mean, look at this kill! He goes fully horizontal when he leaps! <laughs> But you know something? I did not enjoy this film. I found it really depressing. I walked out of it and just felt miserable after watching it. 
Now, I will freely admit to anyone, this is a good film, even though my enjoyment was rock bottom. So this is what I'm trying to say. There is a difference between our enjoyment and the quality of something. I mean, we can like things that still have flaws. I love the Star Wars prequels, even The Phantom Menace. Now this is pod racing. <laughs> So it's important to understand the difference between quality and enjoyment, because if we think our enjoyment is the only way to measure something's quality, then we will struggle to understand and appreciate how everyone has different tastes. We might push a book onto someone even though it's not their style, or we might shame someone for not liking our book, or we might disrespect and undervalue a filmmaker or an author just because we didn't personally connect with their work. Understanding the difference between enjoyment and quality will go a long way to helping us as readers show greater compassion and maturity for people who like things that are different to us. Remember, let people like what they like, let people read what they want to read. Now all of that tangent was just to say there is a big difference in the Dark Tower between the quality and what I think our enjoyment level is going to be. You see, I know it's a pretty weird series, and I know it takes some pretty big risks with its storytelling, and there are some mistakes in it too, but if I were to give my objective opinion, I would say the quality of the Dark Tower is 70%, but my enjoyment of it was 100% all the way through. I enjoyed it so much, warts and all. So yeah, there are some things that worked in it and some things that didn't work in it, but I still enjoy this series as weird as, as it is, and you might enjoy it too. All right, I've mentioned vaguely a few times now just how weird the series is. I don't want to give spoilers, but I do want to give you some specific examples. So I thought long and hard about it and found three examples that will convey how weird it is, but without giving too many spoilers. So first one, there is a sentient train with murderous impulses. Yes, you, you read that right. A sentient train with murderous impulses. So at first, the characters are on Earth, and they read a storybook about Blaine the Train, which is you know, a cute and wholesome story, but with a slightly dark and twisted undertone, just that slight edge of disease. Then when they go to Midworld, the cartet boards a train, which turns out is Blaine the Train, and he's very much alive, and he wants to kill them all. And he intends to crash himself and kill everyone unless they can beat him at a game of riddles. If Baggins loses, we eat it whole. Fair enough. And this is the thing, as bizarre as that is, it kind of works. It's really entertaining and weird. I don't know why it was included in the story, but it's very compelling. It creates a very tense scene with a very memorable villain. And yet afterwards, when you put the book down, you're like, what the hell was that? What, what the, the hell, hell was that? that? The second example of the weirdness is the decapitating plates. So at one point, a town is about to be attacked and all these innocent civilians are killed. The cartet comes in to try to help protect them. Roland and co want to prepare these civilians for battle. And then they find out that the locals have a plate throwing competition that all the women enter into. And so they decide, let's teach these women to throw the plates to decapitate the enemies. So we have a team of gunslingers and then a team of people with holsters filled with plates and they throw plates at the enemy in the battle to decapitate them. At no point does anyone say, hey, how about we just give them guns as well? Or maybe, hey, I don't think plates can decapitate people, like ever. Ah! Ooh, ooh, that's kind of nice. Oh, oh, oh yeah. The third example of weird, the character Stephen King. Yeah, you've probably heard about the, this one because it's a bit infamous, but yes, Stephen King is a character within his own story. So Roland and the cartet one day literally realize that they are characters in a story and that their villain, the Crimson King, is going to send a real world deranged, distracted driver to run over the author Stephen King. And so Roland and co go to find Stephen King to save him from his very real life accident. It's very weird. <laughs> But again, it kind of works. It shouldn't work, but it does. The characters meet Stephen King. They get very mad at him for delaying writing the story in a very meta conversation. It's very self-deprecating in a sweet way, but it's also just so damn bizarre, it can be hard to take seriously. But it works, but it's weird. Ah. <laughs> Alright, I don't think I've ever seen so much representation rolled up into one character. Susanna. She's a woman of colour, amputee, with multiple personalities. I mean, if she were bisexual, we'd have the whole set. <laughs> 
That's a joke. Let's all stay calm. <laughs> Yet with all that representation in one character, she still does not fall into the trap of tokenism. Remember, a token character is when they are just there to be seen with the demographic they represent and not actually be a person. Susanna is very much a person who is well written and has a big, important role in the story. She's very much a three-dimensional character and I truly think she features some of Stephen King's best character writing. So King has always had a lot of strong women in his stories. In fact, his very first book is about a girl who has telekinetic powers who literally murders everyone. I mean, if that is not female empowerment, I don't know what is. That's another joke, everyone. <laughs> Let's take a deep breath. Stephen King also includes a lot of people of colour in his books, all the way through his extended work. Though there is a bit of a criticism that in the early days of his writing, his, uh, his black characters were a bit of a stereotypical white person's perspective on black people. It is a little bit cringe, but it is something that has improved in the years since. There is a decent amount of LGBT characters in the Dark Tower series. They are always in the background, but there's enough of them in the background to make it uh, normalized, which is really the goal. There is not very much of it shown on screen, but I don't want you to get the wrong opinion. See, Stephen King has always been a firm supporter of LGBT rights. Another reason why I idolize this guy. Uh, I'm reluctant to even bring up this topic on the internet, and it could bring all the bigots a raging, but... When J.K. Rowling started uh, proclaiming all of her anti-trans sentiments, Stephen King was among one of the most uh, outspoken authors to speak out against that. So his tweet, yes, trans women are women, very trans affirmative and it made a lot of headlines at the time. And he was one of uh, 1,800 authors, editors, publishers, people in the publishing industry who signed an open letter of support to the trans community after J.K. Rowling's sentiments went public. So props to him there. I know it sometimes feels in this world like you can't buy anything or engage with anything because everyone's problematic in some way. But don't worry, Stephen King is genuinely a wonderful human being and you can ethically support his works. <laughs> A bit of a moderate to heavy content warning for this one. So there is a moderate amount of violence all through the series. There are some brutal and graphic deaths, for example, okay? And Stephen King does not pull his punches on those. Uh, there is also so much swearing. So remember, Susanna has one of those personalities who is very vulgar and speaks a lot of swear words. There are often um, long tirades using all the big swear words. I mean, I'm Australian, I love swearing, even I got a bit uncomfortable at some points. I'm kind of in the middle of something, you Uh, but the real content warning is not so much for the violence or the swearing. Uh, remember how Stephen King is a horror writer most other days of the year? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a bit of horror in this one. <laughs> remember, The Dark Tower is a dark fantasy series. Okay, so not regular fantasy, dark fantasy. Very important distinction. For one, there are a lot of monsters in this world. Remember It from the film and book It? You know, Pennywise the Clown. I won't put a picture on screen in case you're sensitive to that. Pennywise the Clown, he shapeshifts into your worst nightmare. That creature is in the same universe as the Dark Tower. Okay, so kind of think on that level. You may not know this about me, but I'm actually a real horror enthusiast. So I was reading Stephen King through my teenage years and I thought he was fantastic. And I love the occasional slasher horror film. So here's the thing. My horror sense, my, my horror radar is a little bit skewed okay i read this and i was like oh yeah that's a that's some horror but it's not too bad i honestly couldn't tell you all right i might be completely wrong i might be very biased about this okay i didn't think it was that horror ish but i also like a lot of horror so i don't know try for yourself <laughs> oh boy is the ending worth it I literally cannot answer that for you. So normally I include this segment to tell people, is it worth reading the series all the way to the end? Is there a dip in quality and stuff like that? But I can't answer it for you here. The Dark Tower has literally one of the most controversial endings I've ever seen. Some people think it is utter genius, and some people find it infuriating and hate it. Put it this way, before the very final chapter, there is literally a note from the author saying, hey, just so you know, you don't have to read the ending. We've had fun on this series so far, right? Like literally a warning about it. So I can't tell you what your reaction will be. I hope I've sparked your curiosity so you'll actually go and try it. 
all I can say is I personally am firmly in the camp of it was a brilliant ending. I loved it. It was a bit, I wouldn't say, sorry, nothing, nothing more, nothing more. <laughs> I know there was some outrage at the time, at, at the end of the series. A lot of people found it disappointing, but you'll have to read it for yourself and see. How much should you try? Okay, so the first book, The Gunslinger, is probably one of the weakest books in the entire series. It's okay, but book two was significantly better. I've heard some people say that book two was one of the best books in the series. Don't be put off by the first book. Do try to stick through and read the second one as well. That is where you'll get a fair sampling of the overall quality. Uh, just keep in mind, the first four books are a little bit disjointed, and the last three lean into the weird a little bit. So there is a bit of a journey throughout this series. But good luck and happy reading. So that was my introduction to The Dark Tower. I genuinely hope I've excited more people to read it because it is a fantastic series and I love books that push the boundaries of what fantasy can be. I love the series so much, warts and all. Good news, next week uh, we are starting the month of Sci-Fi September. Um, you have been voting on the poll Actually, I'm filming this. I haven't even put up the poll yet. <laughs> I'll finish filming. I'll go put up the poll. So we're covering five big sci-fi book series this this next coming month. Um, I'm pretty sure one of them is going to be Red Rising because with a new book coming out, it's very popular. Uh, just so you know, I haven't actually finished reading the Red Rising series. I was waiting for the next trilogy to come out. So if you do vote for that one, I'll, be have, I'll have to do that at the end of the month so I've got time to actually read it. But I am excited to cover it. Uh, now, like and subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, please comment your thoughts on The Dark Tower below and tell me how great it is or tell me if I've convinced you to read it. I love hearing that I've convinced people to read a series. It's, it's the best feeling. Um, if you want to support the channel, we do have a shop where you can buy some cool stuff to help us out. It's called Rainbow Space Unicorn. Um, please check it out and support us there if you want to help me continue the work I'm doing here. I hope you make time for a book today. And always remember, you are beautiful and wonderful right now, exactly as you are. See you next time, everyone. Bye. One last elephant I wanted to address. Yes, my book collection is all mismatched because I bought it all secondhand. I think I spent about 40 bucks in total on getting this series. I did think about getting the new set so they would look nice for the video, but you know what? It's important for us to acknowledge that sometimes it's okay to just buy books on the cheap if it means they're accessible to you. I love having books that match, but it's okay to have them unmatch as well, as long as you're reading them. Whatever you need, okay? Love you all. Thank you.